Well, thank you all very much. Good, good day, wherever you are. And, and welcome to this conversation, which is exactly what we want it to be, entitled Pressure and Privilege When You're the Only One in the Room. Um, this is certainly something that I have um, felt numerous times throughout my life and in my career. And I'm thinking that there may be other people on the call who have as well. But if not, you'll learn a little bit about what that feeling is like. So let's go ahead and do our introductions really quick. My name is Clarence Clayton. I am a privacy compliance lead at Red Hat. I work in our IT information security organization, and I've been with the company for about seven years. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this conversation and this dialogue today. I think with the challenges that we're facing in the world, it's a very timely conversation to have. And I think no matter what, as we talk about our experiences living as minorities or black and black people in America, in particularly corporate America, there is something to be gained from it, regardless of your racial or ethnic background. So welcome, please do engage with us by putting uh, you know, comments in the chat, asking questions. We'll certainly try to save some time at the end for that as well. I would like to give my partner, my colleague, and my friend a chance to introduce herself as well as we get into this discussion. Yes, thanks, Clarence. I'm happy to be here. Thank you all for joining. I'm Corin Townsend. I'm a welcoming developer at Red Hat. I've been at Red Hat about eight years and in, in currently in the IT strategy and enablement team. And I look forward to just having the discussion with you all and just sharing our experiences. This is not, you know, this is not the end all be all for black people everywhere, but this is our experience between Clarence and myself. And then we have, we'll share kind of some common things in our backgrounds as well as some differences and just how we became on, on the same road together. So um, before we start out, I just wanted to see if there's any red hatters in the room. If you are just post in the chat or you know, what city you're from, what companies are you from? Um, and if, if you've ever felt like, you know, you've gone into your job or, or community outreach organization, and you've only been the one in the room. So how, you know, just post some things in the, in the chat to see where, you know, we can see where everyone is coming from and just your experiences with it all. So we look forward to discussing this with you. Excellent. So as we get into this a little bit, why did we name this session Pressure and Privilege? You're gonna learn a little bit more about that on the next slide. So what you will see here is that uh, there's a picture of, of Serena Williams there. I am a huge, huge, huge Serena Williams fan. Anyone who knows me really well would be able to tell you that. I have, I always liked tennis, but I really started liking it and paying attention to it when Serena and Venus came on the scene in the 90s. So I feel like I've been on this 20 year journey with Serena, watching her achieve greatness and excellence all along the way. And it's just been a pleasure to witness her in action. She's sitting there or standing there in that picture with Billie Jean King, who's another tennis legend in her own right. But because I follow Serena so closely, I've watched a lot of her interviews and people will ask her sometimes, what is it like to be the greatest ever? Because I do think she is one of the greatest athletes ever, male or female, to have ever picked up a racket or done anything in sport. And they'll ask her, what is it like to be that, have that level of greatness and, and always want to you know, compete and, and be, improve and be better and have people that want to beat you when they step out on the court, no matter what. And she will say that Billie Jean King told her that pressure is a privilege and she really wouldn't have it any other way. So when you think about the fact that Serena, you know, has achieved all of these wonderful things and every time that she walks out on the court, people are measuring their game against hers. She sets the bar, she's the gold standard. That's a lot to have to deal with psychologically on top of just wanting to do well and win yourself, but she's handled it with grace and she's also handled it in a sport that there are not a lot of people that look like her and has not always been receptive to her. So while I don't have Serena's fame or money, there are some life lessons that I feel like I and many others can learn from how she's handled herself under such difficult circumstances throughout her career. Corin, any other thoughts about the title or about Serena? 
Yeah, absolutely. Just the fact when Serena and her, her sister Venus came onto the scene, you know, years ago, you know, they they brought a literally a different look to the tennis, uh, the field of tennis, right? And so the fact when I saw them, I was like, well, they look like me. Like they're out here playing tennis and like, and not just playing, but dominating the court, right? And just the fact that they didn't care what people said. People criticized their hair, their body, their skin, their clothes. Like everything was a criticism um, instead of just focusing on the game. And that they, they were really great athletes. And it just helped me to perk up a little bit more because I'm like, well, maybe, you know, despite all of that that they're going through, people are coming at them all the time and they're still dominating and they're not letting that affect them, affect their game. I, I give them much respect and kudos because that's not easy to do. Um, when the whole, we feel like the whole world's coming against you and they still dominate it and are still great to this day. So let's just look at the longevity in that. That's right. You know, she's almost 40, had, had, has had a baby and is still coming back and, and, and playing well and doing well. So that, you know, she's just a, an inspiration really. Yeah. So if we go to the, the next slide, uh, these are some of the, the points that we want to make sure we get out in, in today's conversation. I'm not going to read all of them verbatim, but I'll just summarize it this way. By the time that the session ends, I hope that you've just learned a little bit more about us, how our experiences, uh, even before coming to Red Hat, even before we were born, have shaped and informed who we are and the, the passion that we feel for the work that we do um, at Red Hat to really ad advance diversity and inclusion in our organization. And that I think you'll also just be able to find something that resonates with you, regardless of where you are um, and regardless of who you are. So I'll leave it there because I don't wanna spoil some of the details as we get into it. Uh, Corin, what other major takeaways do you wanna make sure people understand from the, the outset? Yeah, yeah. And it's you know, this is just our experience. This is our truth. This is not, you know, something that we've made up. This is things that we have gone through, not in, and you'll hear in a little bit, just generationally, we've gone through our families and our history. You know, we're not here. This is not a pity party. We don't need a woe is me type of thing. That's not what we're here for, but we're here to just share with you our perspectives of the things that we've gone through and that people are continuing to having to go through. So I look forward to the discussion and I hope you you know, put in the chat anything that resonates with you, anything, you know, questions you may have or things you want to discuss. So this is a, this is a discussion and we're just, you know, here to help kind of facilitate and share our experiences at the same time. You got it. So, all right, let's go ahead and get into it. So pressure and privilege lesson number one, history is a great teacher. So let's go to the next slide. So this is a picture of my mother. And in this picture, she was in high school and my mother was the first uh, in the first class to integrate her high school in Northampton County, North Carolina. It's uh, down in the Eastern part of the state. Now my grandparents were really active in uh, the civil rights movement and fighting for equal rights for, for black students among, and not just students, just across the board but they wanted the same educational opportunities to be available to their children that were available to the white students in the county. So when the time came to integrate the high school, it was my mother that you know was the one of her, my grandparents' children that was up next to entering the high school. And she did not want to go. She begged and pleaded with them to not send her, to just let her go to the black high school where it was safer, where it was just a more familiar, more welcoming environment. Uh, but they said, how could they have been fighting for these rights and, and fighting for this change? And then when they had the opportunity to actually take advantage of it themselves, or at least for, for their children, that they not send one of their children, that that just would have been cowardly and hypocritical. So they couldn't do it. And I, it was gut-wrenching for them to, to have to tell their teenage child, no, you have to go into an environment that is not going to be welcoming. And welcoming, it was not. They did not want them there. They would get up from the tables when you'd sit down to eat lunch. My mom told me times that they would brush themselves off if they accidentally bumped into each other in the hallway. 
She took, they didn't have a prom. The guidance counselor didn't stress to the black students at the school, the importance of continuing their education beyond high school and that just going and getting a job at the factory was a viable outcome. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it wasn't, it's not, they didn't even stress the importance of college as a possibility. So there were all kinds of structural and systemic challenges that, that she had to face, but she overcame it. She graduated from, from high school, but she would tell you her high school experience was nothing like your typical high school experience. You don't look back on, on it with fondness. But later on, she got married, she had me, and she told me about all of this. So these are, are lessons and stories that have been with me um, all throughout my life. And if you go to the next slide, what you'll see there is a picture of, of me last year. And in 2019, I was fortunate to be selected as one of Red Hat's Chairman's Award winners. That's one of Red Hat's highest honors given to their associates. And that's a picture of me with our former CEO, Jim Whitehurst and the board of the directors at the time. And you know we were flown to Boston, beautiful dinner, beautiful scenery, as you can see in the background, looked like something, almost like that I shouldn't have been there, but it was just a very he heady, rarefied air type of moment. And when I sat with that a little bit, I thought back to my mom and I said, this is not an award that she probably would have won in 1965. This is not an award I would have won in 1965. But she opened doors, she and many others like her open doors that I could walk through without those same barriers. And they created you know, a trail and blazed the trail that just made it easier for the generation that came behind them. So I'm very thankful to her and so many others that were a part of that, you know, that, that journey and made it easier for me. Now, I wanna also say this, I was the only black recipient of the chairman's award that year. I am only the third to have received it at this time out of 276 recipients of the award, of the reward up to this point. So we made a lot of progress, no question about it, but there is still a lot to be done so that situations like that and, and, and award ceremonies like that look more like the world that we live in. So I am proud of the work that we've done. It certainly was a full circle moment and the other point that I want to bring out there is that the, the pressure that my mother had to experience maybe didn't create privilege for her, but it did create privilege and opportunities for her son and for people that, that came behind her. So right. that's my history moment, Corin. over to you. Yes, we are very similar in, in many ways. So this is a picture of my parents, Nancy and Louis Atwater from uh, Chapel Hill. And they were born and raised, grew up there. And, the, you know, they both went to the segregated black high school there at the time, this is in the mid sixties, called Lincoln High School. And my father graduated from that, but my mother, like your mom was in the, uh, her, she spent her senior year as one of the first black students to integrate the new Chapel Hill High School. Um, and again, there are challenges, there are, you know, obstacles, right? They didn't want them there, they, they loved it being segregated, right? And, and so the fact that they, that she didn't quit, right? She didn't, you know, stop or go get a job. Like she kept going, being the only one in some of her classes, being the only one sometimes sitting at the lunch table by yourself, like walking through the halls and, and, and hearing people kind of snickering at you. That, yeah, that's a, that's a, not a great way you want to spend your senior year, but she didn't quit and she kept going after it. Later on, she went on to be assistant admin at UNC's dental school. Now, you're talking about late 80s, early 90s for a black woman in this field, which was pretty much unheard of, right? She was the only black person in her group, only, only female in her group. And then there were times when, you know, she wouldn't get a promotion, she wouldn't get a raise, and they wouldn't give her a concrete answer why. But the fact that she stuck, she stuck with it, and I wholeheartedly believe because her her perseverance and staying in technology is a reason why it had such an influence on my career. Um, she would bring her work home and she would take apart the computer 
and put it back together again. And I just thought it was the greatest thing ever. And I think that's why it kind of kind of stuck with me. My father, on the other hand, um, not only is he a retired drill sergeant in the army, so he had a lot of discipline behind his life. But being a black man in the army is is not an easy thing, especially when you're having to, you know, command white men, right? And you're talking about 70s, uh, late late 60s, late 60s, early 70s. That's not an easy feat. And he stuck with it. And he actually retired from the Army after 30 years. Um, and then he, at the same time, he was in the Army Reserve. He also was in, in the uh, Chapel Hill Fire Department. And he worked his way up through the ranks and became the first Black captain and first assistant chief in the history of the department. And there were times that he would tell me that they did not want to give him that promotion, that he had to actually fight for it and go and actually, you know, threaten to kind of go to HR to say, yes, I have my qualifications and you still are not trying to give me the promotion that I deserve. So he would just tell me stories just about being the only one, you know, people not listening to him. And, but the thing is with all of them and, and Clanch, your, your family too, that they didn't quit. They kept going because they knew that the struggle that they were going through was going to be someone's victory eventually. And that, that, that perseverance continues to pass down through the family. And so it's, yeah, you may be the only one at the table, in the room, in the company even, but you keep going. There was a time when we all have to struggle a little bit, but know that, you know, your struggle is not in vain, that somebody, it will pay off eventually. Which leads us to our next lesson, which is Black majority versus Black minority. So this next picture I'm going to show you is very interesting that as yes, Clarence and I were doing research for this uh, for this talk is that we were kind of comparing upbringings in a way. And so on the left side is what my high school looked like. This was my junior year cheerleading high school picture. There's two of us in the picture. Actually, the mascot was a black female too, so technically three, right? And then on the right side is Clarence's high school. And it's very different. I grew up very much all white neighborhood. Most, I grew up in Chapel Hill, Carborough area, mostly white town. Um, elementary, middle, high school looked just like this. I was always usually the only one. And it to me, it was just normal. That's how it was. And that's how I adjusted. It wasn't like, you know, I wasn't upset about it. It would, it would have been nice to have more, more of a diverse, you know, school upbringing. But at the same time, this was the hand that I was dealt. And the fact that I even went on to NC State University, which again is a predominantly white university, it wasn't a whole lot of us there, but it was enough of us to kind of create a, a community and a family in a sense that, you know, we stuck together and that, you know, we, we, we formed this kind of bond because we were the only ones. Um, and I know Clarence, you talk about just how everything you had around you was very much African-American. And then, you know, corporate America sometimes you know, does it really mimic that as well? I mean, what is your experiences as you were growing up, Clarence? Yep. I and mean, as, as you can see from the picture, I mean, that's, you know, when I was in high school, I don't know if it was my sophomore or junior year, one of the two, but exact polar opposite of your experience, <laughs> Corin. My neighborhood, as much as you can have a neighborhood in the country, uh, was all Black. Elementary, middle school, high school, predominantly 90% Black. And another quick point I want to make, if you tie this back to my mother, the high school that, that she went to is basically the same high school that I went to. And there are 24 years in between when she graduated and when I went to high school. Mm -hmm. And in that 24 years, it had gone from what she experienced to something totally different. Now, we don't have time to really unpack all of that today, but I mean, there's a such thing as white flight. They decided, you know what? Don't like that. Gonna give the, the school to you. And they moved to the neighboring county or to other parts of the county and just allowed that to become a, a primarily black school. So it's just amazing how in the, the circle of in that same building and that same structure, how it had morphed from mostly white to almost exclusively black in the course of that time. Uh, I also went to an HBCU, a historically black college. I went to North Carolina A&T. So if there are any Aggies on the call, Aggie pride. And 
so the first 21 years of my life primarily were, you know, around exclusively black people. Now I did uh, bowl and that was my one of my extracurricular activities. And that was mostly white, a few black people, not too many. So, and that was different for me. And I remember even as a kid saying, okay, that's different. I'm not used to this, but it was certainly a, a forebearer or foreshadowing of what, you know, the world was going to be, what my world was going to be. But that was just for two or three hours on a Saturday. And then I went back into my black bubble. But by the time I started my career, and it was not unlike many corporate American environments, I was, you know, one of few on, on my team. And I don't remember being shell shocked by it though. I don't remember saying, I, I can't function. I can't focus. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. So I wasn't paralyzed with the fear. I, my mom had told me what I was going to be, you know, what I needed to be prepared for and what I was going to be up against. So I felt ready in that regard. And I've just always been adaptable in that way to just be able to just jump in and, and, and figure it out. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the challenge, you know, with that, that I feel some people deal with in that I sort of feel like I didn't. Because, because I had so much time in the majority, I almost feel like I know what it's like for the white majority, because I, I lived it. So I understand what it's like that, you know, that may be blind spots or perspectives you don't have because you're more in the majority group. So that doesn't make it okay, but it does give me a different ability, I think, to understand and try to meet people where they are and figure out if there's a way that, you know, we can walk forward together and have a different understanding. So that's, um, you know, that's sort of my background and how it, it brought me uh, up to, you know, where I started my career. Right. So I think we're moving into the, the next lesson, which, you know, talks about the psychological challenges. So Corn and I sort of set the stage of, you know, how we got into corporate America. And now that we're here, how do you deal with that? So if you go to the next uh, slide here, you'll see a, a picture of this gentleman. And if you can look, for the most part, it looks like he's almost the only one in that picture. It might be a, a young lady over there in the corner that, that, that's black, but for the most part, he, he's the only one. Don't know what he's thinking, don't know how he feels about it, but the visual is, is clear that he is one of um, very few that look like him in, in that environment. And that's been my experience many times. Mm -hmm. When I, it, it, before I came to Red Hat and, and even since I've been there, I've been you know the only one on my team. And there are conversations that happen that I know nothing about. There are TV shows that people watch that I know nothing about. There are experiences and trips and movies and you name it. There's a lot of, of conversation that's happened that I just don't have perspective for. And I don't know that I can make a meaningful, authentic contribution. And there are times where I've said, so should I go and Google that and try to act like I know what they're talking about, although I really don't? Or do I say nothing? And then you're like, well, you're not really fitting in and gelling with the team. Or do I offer something that they may not have any you know, perspective for, and then that's still you know, awkward. So these are all challenges, all things that are sort of swirled in my mind. And this is just trying to have a conversation. We, I'm not even really trying to do any work. I'm just trying to figure out how to you know, bond with the, the team. But something else I wanted to share really quickly is I have been really fortunate in my career, especially at Red Hat, to work on some really high profile uh, projects where Jim Whitehurst, the former CEO, and the current CEO, Paul Cormier, have been in the room. I've been in the Red Hat boardroom. There is, I don't see anyone that looks like me. I look on the, the video con conference, I don't see anyone that looks like me. And I say, okay. I want to do the best job I absolutely can because it's important to me to show up well for myself and my own personal brand. 
But here's the other thing that I, I want people to know. And I'm not saying all black people are like this. I'm just speaking for me. I feel an extra burden and pressure to perform and do well. Because if I don't, I am afraid that I am cutting off a potential opportunity for another black person. I feel that the other black co my other black coworkers at Red Hat and people who are not even in the door yet are counting on me to do well so that they may get an opportunity. Doesn't mean that they will certainly get one, but they might get one. But if I bomb, if I fall on my face and I just am unable to deliver, I have this, this fear of, well, that didn't work out too well. We're probably not gonna you know, go in that direction again. And here's the thing, I had this conversation with one of my white colleagues, a white man, and he said, that thought has never crossed my mind. I said, and that thought crosses my mind every single time I'm in a high pressure situation like that, that I'm representing something far greater than me. So I want you to just think about that reality. That's the psychology of I'm in here. Not only do I want to do well, I got all these other processes running in my head that I have to confront and move beyond and push through in order to try to be successful. So that's the psychology of being the only one in the room. Corn, what about you? Absolutely. The, the whole, like, you know, going back to what you were saying about trying, you know, fitting in, just the, the cultural differences, you know, and you're not talking about just work. There's a lot about music, pop culture, clothing, even your hair. Like, it's, it sometimes can be a conversation, but it, it can be like, you know, I don't know what you all are talking about. I haven't seen that before. Absolutely. That, that kind of that pull to kind of fit in, to be a team player, but at the same time, still, you know, holding on to your authenticity. That's, that's, that's huge. Um, and, and there is this pressure to, you know, I don't want to screw this up because if I screw it up, then, you know, I don't know if somebody else will get a chance. And that goes through my mind a lot, especially every, you know, every new company that I'm, I'm with, there is this kind of underlying thought that, yeah, you know, how many black people are here? You know, how, how can I help other black people get here? But that means I have to be almost nearly perfect in everything that I do because somebody else, you know, they may see that and, and not want to give a chance to someone else. And so absolutely, it is, it is definitely, you know, in our thoughts a lot. Um, in every situation, especially like you were saying, in high profile situations, you know. Um, the one thing I found like it helps to kind of, you know, deal with that is like finding community amongst the people there, amongst the other black people there, other, other females even. Just having that sense and that camaraderie with other people who may be going through what you're going through. And that kind of leads us into our next point of, you know, finding community, right? So lesson four, you can stand alone or you can build a community. And Bill will talk about what, what Bill really means. But it's, it's about finding people who have like interests and who want to make a difference for wherever you are. So Clarence and I are a part of an organization. It's an ERG, an employee resource group called BUILD. It stands for Blacks United in Leadership and Diversity. It is a D diversity and inclusion group at Red Hat. We were established... And the thought started in 2015. John Chapman thought of it. He is also an NC State alum. Um, how can we just get Black people together? We really were meeting kind of secretly and on the side that we didn't really, weren't sure how Red Hat and the management, management staff would really be open to us meeting. And so it was really like secretive meetings at lunch. And it really just started out about let's just network. You know, we happened all, most, a lot of us were on the 15th floor of the headquarters of Red Hat, and we just started saying, hey, let's just get together, let's just talk, let's just socialize a little bit, get to know each other. And from that, in 2017, it grew into being an official DNI community of Red Hat. And we started thinking, well, how can we not only just helping, you know, the associates of Red Hat, but what else can we do maybe outside of Red Hat to get more you know, applicants from HBCUs coming into Red Hat and thinking there's got to be a way that we could do more. And so it, it was a it was a not only a networking opportunity for the Black Associates, but it was also retention. Like people were staying at Red Hat because of their connections that they made within the DNI group. 
you know, we were kind of a, a built in support system in many ways. And not just within our inside of Red Hat, but also outside. We do a lot of community outreach. We partner with the Daniel Center for Science and Math that is in downtown Raleigh. Just, you know, making sure that children of that, even that age, K through 12, know what Red Hat is. Everybody, you know, there's a lot of brands out there, but do people really know what Red Hat really does? And we wanted to make sure that that pipeline into Red Hat and just knowing who we are was familiar to even children of that age. And we've done several things with campus outreach. We just had a, earlier this month, we had an outreach opportunity and an all day event where we taught um, HBCU students, like what is open source? What does Red Hat do? How can you get a job? What about internships? I mean, this was things that we just thought, thought that it would be a great way to help increase that pipeline into Red Hat. And the fact that now Red Hat has really invested truly in DNI, I think speaks volumes of the, you know, they see it helping the bottom line. They see it connects their associates. It connects people to the company and we're helping people to really want to do better. I know, Clarence, you and I were both on the kind of the founding member, one of two of the founding members of Build mm -hmm. and just how, you know, what is your perspective on how we've grown over the last five years officially? You know, it's, it's so interesting. I remember when we first, when I first came to Red Hat, we, I noticed it's like it, the black people didn't really do a whole lot of like socializing, didn't really you know talk to each other. And I, I've said this before, Corin and I have known each other the entire time we've been at Red Hat. We've never worked on a project together. I would see her in the hallway, we'd smile, we'd say hello, but that was that was sort of it. We've just never been on a project together. But we've done something really, really important and meaningful that has just made outstanding contributions to Red Hat's culture. Every time I think of like proud accomplishments in my career, the work that you know we've done with Bill is at the mm -hmm. top of the list. They, I say all the time, you mentioned retention. It is retention. Red Hat has been a great company for me and to me, but I really wouldn't want to leave Build. I would not want to leave the, the people the community, the connection, the camaraderie, the fellowship, the friendship, you know, the, the bonds that we formed with each other over the last five years mm -hmm. have been, you know, nothing short of, of amazing. We support each other inside and outside of work. And, you know, family, our families have gotten to know each other. So it is, and it's absolutely a built-in retention uh, component. If companies take the time to invest in it, absolutely. One other thing I wanted to say really quick is Build has really allowed me to, I would, what I would call, lean into my blackness at work. And that could be taboo because there's some people who say, I just want to be seen for doing a great job. And there's nothing wrong with, with wanting to be seen for doing a great job. The fact of the matter with the world that we're living in, I cannot take this off. And the good news is that Red Hat doesn't want or expect me to. And I have not felt at any point that being a lead in this organization, in this community has been to the detriment of my career. So I appreciate and applaud that the company wants to have these conversations and gives us a forum to actually be able to do it. So I am just looking forward to continuing to build on the, the success that we've had and, and seeing what we can you know, do next. We set a really high bar for ourselves each and every year. And I'm just proud to know that you know, we you know, continue to exceed that bar. And I know that that's going to continue. Yeah. So and just one shout out on. before you finish. Um, sure. Clarence is the chair, uh, the current chair of Build right now and is doing an awesome job leading this community and has has always continues to raise the bar. Just want to put that out there because thank you, Clarence. You were uh, a, a natural leader, so know that. It's but it's a, a group of people working together, and and we we are the engine that powers the success. And Corn is affectionately known as the first lady of Bill, <laughs> and she wears the title very very well. So I think we're getting to our last uh, lesson. Yep which is really about finding and using your voice and answering the call. So look, we just keep it all the way real. 2020 has been 
a year. And it's still October. We haven't gotten to December yet. 2020 has really been a challenging year. We had our plans of what we thought we were going to do with Build this year. And then the pandemic happened. So we had to change all of that anyway. And then May happened where, you know, we had the murder of George Floyd. And before that, you had other things going on with Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. None of this is new. None of this is new, by the way. But it was thrust into the spotlight this year in such a bright and harsh way that we really had no choice but to confront it and say, you know, what are we going to do? Who do we want to be? What side of this moment and movement do you really want to be on? And the protest and, and things happened in downtown Raleigh, I think the weekend of May 31st. Mm -hmm. And after that, Corn and I were contacted and said that there are things that we feel like we need to do as an organization, as our as Red Hat, and we do need some assistance figuring out how to hit the right marks. And I am glad that Build existed because Build exists because of the the, the relationships and the the reputation that that our community and Corin and I have been able to co help cultivate. We were uniquely positioned to be at the table to mm -hmm. participate in that conversation. Now, I say this all the time. I am not a DNI expert. I just have 40 years of experience as a, a black man uh, and 20 in corporate America as a black man. So I can tell you from that perspective what I think you need to do, but we did not go to school for this. But we were uniquely qualified, I think, to meet the moment and be able to give some thought leadership to the organization. So. Really quickly here, I don't want to cover the, the picture there um, is with me and my daughters. Red Hat painted a mural in downtown Raleigh just to let the, the community, let the city know that we stand in solidarity in the fight against racial and social injustice. Uh, Paul Cormier, our CEO, put a, a, a note out on our website, letting it be known exactly where Red Hat stands. And we've also established some really strong partnerships with a couple of organizations. The Southern Coalition for Social Justice is very involved in the fight for, for social justice in, uh, in North Carolina and in the southeastern part of the country. And we're also getting really more established with Shaw University, which is right in Red Hat's backyard. Literally, you can walk to Shaw from Red Hat's headquarters. These are just a few things. There's a lot more that needs to be done, but these are all positive steps that we are taking and have been taken based on guidance and recommendations from the build community. So it's nice to be at the, the table. And when you talk about pressure and privilege, again, the, the, the pressure of these challenges that we've dealt with is, is a lot. The pressure of having taken on this additional burden above and beyond our day job is a lot, mm -hmm. but there is privilege in being able to say that you built a community that's thriving and doing so well and is able to also contribute to the conversation about bringing about meaningful and long lasting change. Corin, what would you share about our last few months? Absolutely. I remember that day was Sunday, May 31st, around 2 p.m. We got the call and said, hey, we need build input on helping with the direction of, you know, DNI efforts to help our associates. Um, the fact that we had already kind of been doing, organ you know, organized work for about three years up until that point, you know, it, the timing couldn't have been better. I think we were prepared and ready for that call and that the leadership team that we had was awesome and that we jumped on it and just kind of ran with it. The fact that Red Hat has been so supportive of having us at the table has been a blessing because it, 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 could, it could have gone a different way, right? I mean, the fact that, you know, over the last three years, one thing that we as Build has done is host Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service, which is something that we started back in what, three years, uh, 2018 that it was just a lunch and learn. We just came, we ate lunch, we, we you know, watched some videos of MLK. And then up until last year, where well, it's a full day. We work, we, everybody in the company has an opportunity to serve. You don't have to take a vacation day, but you do, you do have to volunteer in some way. 
and that that kind of started out of build and just Red Hat seeing that need and seeing that people want to give back. I mean, just the think of the things that we've done over the last three years has been pretty amazing. And I, I look forward to continuing the work and there is much work to be done. We're not done. We haven't crossed, crossed the finish line yet. There is lots of work to be done. And I look forward to continued partnership, especially with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, because they not only do social, they do um, social justice issues, but they do, you know, police advocacy and uh, voter education rights. I mean, these are things that affect us all outside of the building of Red Hat. So I look forward to continuing to do the work and we've, we, you know, we've done some really amazing things over the years. Indeed. All right. So we're, we're wrapping up here. So we're going to, I'm going to hit this, you know, really quickly, just some things to remember and take away from today's discussion. Your struggle may be someone else's victory. It may not happen in your time, but you may be blazing a trail for someone else, just like my mom. Um, and hopefully like me, I'm hoping that my children, Corin's children and the generations behind us don't have to deal with some of the things that we've have, had, have had to deal with. And, and everyone can do something. A lot of times I hear people say, well, you know, I don't know what to do. You can read a book, you can watch a podcast, you can go paint a mural, you can donate money, you, you can do it. There is something for everybody to do to either contribute to that movement or just learn. Mm -hmm. So have a conversation with your colleague and say, hey, I'd like to understand. Like, you know, can we just go for coffee, go for tea? jump on a, a, a Google Meet and just have a chat, which goes into building those genuine connections with your coworkers. Yeah. I can't imagine my life at Red Hat without the friends and coworkers and the tribe that, that is around me and helps support me and, and lift me up. That sustains me and it helps to know that you're not alone and that you have people who actually care about you and wanna see you do well. Corin, what is some of your final takeaways? Yeah, the, the fact that we have this support circle um, is is vital. I think that is what has kept a lot of us connected to the the company and just to each other. And like that, we know that we're all in this struggle together. You know, I, I say if you ever want to know more about a different culture or a different experience, just have a conversation. It's nothing formal. Just talk to your coworkers. You know, it's it's it not it doesn't have to be a big thing. You know, the work is there, the work needs to be done. And are you in this or aren't you? Like if you're not a part of the solution, then you're gonna be a part of the problem, right? So continue to just connect with your coworkers and make this, you know, this is a movement, you know? It's, it's not a moment, it's a movement. It's, kind of, it's a continuous um, cycle of work that we will all be a part of. Um, and, it, it's, and a friend of ours said this quote to us, you know, you are built for this moment. And I say, no, we are built for this moment, this movement. This will continue to go on. And like our parents, the sacrifices they made, we won't ever have to make to that degree, but we do, there is a struggle to be had and we're willing to do the work, so. Okay, we will do this really quick and then maybe try to take two <laughs> questions. So yeah. I encourage everybody to go and look and you can look at the QR code August 28th, the day in the life of a people was directed by Ava DuVernay and it was amazing. It just talks about some really historical moments in black history that all happened on August 28th. But this poem was a part of that, that documentary and uh, Corn and I wanna at least read a couple of lines from it here. It was written in 1928 and although it's been 92 years, I think it's still relevant today. So here we go. I am not tragically colored. There is no great sorrow damned up in my soul or lurking in my eyes. I do not mind at all. I do not belong to the sobbing school of Negrohood who maintain that nature has somehow given them a low down dirty deal and whose feelings are all hurt about it. Even in the helter skelter skirmish that is my life, I have seen that the world is for the strong regardless of a little pigmentation more or less. No. I do not weep at the world. I am too busy sharpening my oyster knife. And this, if you've, ever, if you've never seen the video, I suggest take your phone out and, and scan that QR code. It's a really, really impactful video of just August 28th and what it kind of means to American history. Um, and, and, and to that, thank you for hearing us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining this session. 
we look forward to having a conversation. We're going to take a couple of questions and, you know, be a part of the movement. And thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. Any questions? So it looks like we have, Rick, I don't know if you were going to read them. It looks like we have a few. Maybe we can go to like, say, 348 and yeah. that'll That's still give time it. to move. Okay. Yeah, um, I can read the first. I'll read the first uh, one. Go, oh, ahead. go ahead. I'll do the first one. How okay. do you address what must be constant asks from well-meaning non-BIPOC Black Indigenous people of color individuals to do their own work and advocate for racial parity and equity and be better allies? Uh, I'll take this one really quick because it, I mean, it's a very real question, and I'll also be the first one to say I don't always have all the answers. I can tell you what I think. I can give you, you know, my perspective. Um, or maybe some other like, you know, podcasts and things that I listen to. But I will tell you something that we did do um, and build is we actually started up an allyship work stream. So there is a group uh, that is dedicated to supporting the work and ongoing education of allies. Um, it's meant to be a safe space for those non-BIPOC individuals to really be able to confront some of their biases and some of the, the challenges or maybe misunderstandings or misperceptions uh, that they maybe have been taught or, or thought about all their life. And it's, it's led by a, a white woman is actually the lead of the allyship work stream in consultation with some, some black uh, members of BUILD who also provide some thought leadership in that space. So that seems to have worked well. We've been able to sort of move that work um, into its own dedicated area. Mm -hmm. And maybe one more. Just one more. The next mm -hmm. one says, have you had the opportunity to work for a minority owned company so far? And if so, how different has it impacted your pressure privilege psyche, regardless of your team's racial composition? Um, I have not. <laughs> um, I, I even had an experience where I was the only one in the whole company. It was a small startup company and I was the only black female and only black person and, and and the fact that you know it kind of felt there was this kind of air of you know i checked both boxes i'm black and female diversity done we don't need to worry about it anymore you know it you adjust right I, because i've kind of had that my entire life i adjusted to what was given you know i don't get upset don't get mad I'm just i work with what i have and keep it moving right i, I can't i don't think you can sit there and be angry because that doesn't not going get, to get you anywhere. But I mean, Clarence, have you had, ever had an opportunity to work for a minority owned company or in that I, capacity? I, I have not. I have, I have not. But I'm, I will tell you, my mom worked at an HBCU. She worked at, um, a, mm. it's closed now, St. Paul's College. Um, so it was mostly, you know, Black. And I mean, I'll tell you, we've had a lot of conversations about corporate America. And she would also say, that's just not something, they didn't have to deal with the same challenges. That's not to say that they didn't have issues but they weren't some of the things that I think that we experience. Um, so I know that we are running up against time. Um, please do connect with us on LinkedIn and, um, and maybe we can just continue the conversation. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to the last two questions there, but uh, please connect with us on LinkedIn. Just happy to continue the dialogue there. And uh, I just, again, thank you all for, for participating. Thank you all for all the engagement and all the positive comments in the, the chat. I'm going to have to go back and look through all of that at some point. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to do this with you all again another time.